This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live with a special, wonderful show that has been long in the making. We are so delighted to have Bobby Hall with us today. He is an original member of the Peter Moon Band, and we're going to talk today about the phenomenon of the Peter Moon Band. So welcome to you, Bobby. Hello, Jay. Great, um, great thanks to Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. And my co-host, Ray Tsuchiyama, who's a, the Renaissance person, <laughs> who joins us on the show. We call it Life After Statehood. Because somehow, you know, life after statehood is a good, a good container for this discussion. Okay. Uh, Peter Moon Band and music, Hawaiian music, the kind of hapahali music. Can I call it that? Can I call it that? To me, you can. Okay, yeah. okay, all right. I'm not uh, <laughs> so politically correct anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us how you got involved in music, Bobby, and tell us how you got involved in the Peter Moon Band. Music, well, I almost kind of just fell into music. It wasn't something planned. Um, we were around music from, you know, when we were young. Um, my mom used to, uh, you know, play music, perform music as a hula dancer when she was young. And my dad always enjoyed singing. So when we had um, get-togethers or family parties at the house, it always, you know, got to music. Everybody started. So as a young kid, you, you just kind of listen and you hear it and you remember it. It wasn't really until after I got out of high school that I really started even having an interest in music. Um, and it came all by chance, you know, just in my college days, which were the early 70s, um, you know, guys just wanted to kind of get together just as college kids would, and then you pick up an instrument and you just start, you know, playing. So, okay, I went along with the gang and did all that and, um, you know, realized that I could, you know, do this not bad, and not, not me, fairly well. And we started doing this as friends, you know, week, weekly, almost every weekend, kind of do that. And, and it got to a point where uh, a good friend of ours who was part of this group, you know, moved to Denver to go to school. And the rest of us back here on the rock, okay, let's go visit him. Let's go visit Scott. Okay, well, we can't afford to visit Scott, so how, how can we do this? So maybe we can go and earn some money playing music on the side. So that's what we did. Three of us, my younger brother, a good friend of mine, his name is Gary Shimabukuru. Um, no relation to, to um, um, Jake, but you know, same last name. Um, we decided to go and look for a small gig that could earn us enough money so we could visit our friend in Denver. We landed a job at the Outrigger Reef Hotel. It was a three night a week job. And it got to the point where we were good enough to stay there and continue there and we could never take off. So we, our plans to go to the mainland never came to fruition. We started playing, got a little bit more popular, did you know, more private gigs, uh, got to play with other brands in Waikiki, and it kind of just took off from there, totally unplanned. Now your songs, did you develop your songs yourselves, or you took songs that were out there? What well, kind of we took songs you? that were out there. I mean, we, we weren't initially into writing songs, so we just took the traditional Hawaiian music. We, you know, we started music when we called the uh, Hawaiian Renaissance right. was in full swing, late 60s, early 70s. You know, it was you know, very inspirational to us to have uh, traditional Hawaiian music blended in with contemporary music, period. You know, so it was more appealing for us. So we tried to figure out how the chords go, how to do that. And just the interest in learning more about the music, you know, took me back to listen to the old Gabby songs, the old Sons of Hawaii songs, the old Hawaii Call songs, the old John DiMello, you know, orchestra stuff, and I really started to absorb that. So there really that. is a, a, a Hapa'ali strain in your I music? Mean, I mean, yeah, it was a Hapa'ali strain to begin with, um, you know, and it's, it, it was kind of unplanned. It just kind of yeah. grew there. And, uh, what, what differentiates the music that you were developing against um, other music at the time? Because you were, you were different, if not unique. Well, the Peter Moon Band uh, itself didn't um, formulate until the late 70s. Okay. In the early seven, late 60s, early 70s, um, Peter was already playing music. He was playing with the Pahinui Sons. He was playing with Palani Vaughn at that time. And then he formed a group which um, we all know uh, well, the Sunday Manoa with Robert and Roland Casmaro. And that synergy, along with everything else that was happening, inspired a lot of guys who liked the music, including myself. Um, that sort of launched interest from, you know, 
groups that are like Olamana, Country Comfort, uh, Beamer Brothers, all of everybody just kind of came up together around the same time, in, including you know myself and the group that I was in, and it, it just stayed that way, um, you know, throughout the 70s. Um, uh, Peter ventured on from the Sunday Manoa. Robin and Roland became the Casimero Brothers, mm -hmm. and, they were uh, at the Royal and they ended up at the Royal Hawaiian. But you know, the music was in everybody's DNA already. Um, and it, you know, it basically took traditional Hawaiian music and, you know, gave it some upbeat or, or just reintroduced music from the past to the current generations and made it, made it flavorful enough so the music, you know, attracted everybody. Once the music attracted, you know, um, that generation, then everything else got brought in, the culture, the dance, the hula, the food, the, the habits. The Renaissance everything. wasn't just musicians playing music. I mean, music. you know, I, more than that. I, I would, I don't think it'd be fair to me to say that it was just music. I mean, there was a lot of things happening, but, you know, for me and for a lot of people, the, you know, what we heard, what was appealing, and, you know, the, the music sort of gave us, okay, well, this is, this is neat. Yeah. Well, I, in, a, in a sense, you know, Hawaiian music was a portal, a way to uh, enter, you know, a larger, uh, you know, uh, Hawaiian Renaissance of that time. But again, you know, uh, what he, uh, what is saying is how to make Hawaiian music cool. I think that, that's the key. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. you call it the Chalangalang way, but, you know, not everybody was, you know, uh, that, that wasn't appealing to, you know, maybe my generation at the time. So <laughs> it, it made it interesting. Yeah. And if there's a porthole, it's basically looking backwards mm -hmm. as far as trying to project forward. Right. You know, how can this music, you know, what else can we do yeah, with yeah, this yeah. music? You know, yeah. and then um, when... Um, Peter decided to, you know, get back in the music scene and, and form the Peter Moon Band. He he wanted to take it even another notch. He wanted to push the the, the limits of the music, and um, you know we got into some pretty fast up tempo rock and roll stuff. And the, <laughs> well, that, 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 that drove you, that. You, yeah. With the uh, person of that, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, and and you know, um, you know, I, I won't say that we were solely responsible for the transition, but. That became a new sound for the the people in the 80s, oh, early 90s right. generation. Right. They started listening to something that's a little bit more appealing to them, and you know we pushed the gamut: rock and roll, reggae, 40s, 50s, hapa haole, traditional Hawaiian, and that was all interesting to us. You know, every, everybody in the band had had a broad background of music that they already played, so it, was, it became interesting. So it was a great time of experimentation, in, in a sense. You know, for us, and, and I credit that to Peter. Mm. I mean, his experimentation yeah. uh, style goes back to when you know he forged uh, the union with the Sunday Manoa, mm. you know, and, and tested that limit, and, and you know, got traditional Hawaiian music to this level, and you know, maybe just out of being you know, impatient, he, he kind of jumped on the Peter Moon Band era and we started a, another level of music interest, you know. And, and it worked well. It worked well for us. I want to go back for a minute to the whole notion of the Renaissance. What do you think created this Renaissance? Because that's what Ray and I study. Right. We, we study all the strains of, of historical development, cultural development, economic development since, since statehood, sometimes before. But what do you think created the Renaissance? How did this come together? You know, I'm, I'm a victim of the tree in the forest because I was, you know, living and breathing yeah, at yeah, that yeah. time that had happened. Yeah. So from, from my perspective, it just became, you know, interesting to, to learn about the music. And then the music led to your culture. It led to your heritage background. It led to a lot of other stuff. And it, it was up to you to take it how far you wanted to learn. Yeah. You know, there was a growing interest and development in, in, in hula, kahiko hula right. and, you know, awana hula, and even a, a more, you know, broader interest in music. So everybody coined that phrase renaissance. It's, I don't know if I'm the best person to describe it, you know, but it's like Woodstock. If, if you were there, you were there. Right? <laughs> you, you know, can can you like, explain the three days that you were there? Probably not. <laughs> <Tell anybody. laughs> you know, I, I know a woman named Fumiko Wellington. She plays for the uh, Hawaii Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And she's been playing a long time. And her father was, was a musician, and they came over, and we interviewed her a couple of years ago. Her father came over from the mainland, and she settled, he settled, uh, she was a child, in Kailua. She went to Kailua High School. She, she said she was surrounded by music, surrounded. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. There was music everywhere, and there was no question of priority. It was a priority. Everybody loved it. Everybody, you know, spent their time, invested their time. The parents, children, teachers, everybody. Mm -hmm. but since that time, it has diminished, don't you think? Um, and I mean, I wonder how that plays with the Renaissance. You have a Renaissance. You have people interested, maybe far and wide. But then at the same time, in Hawaii, we don't put as much time into creating the music as we used. To. Well, um, yes and no. I, you know, nowadays the media and the technology allows people to create music right from their bed yeah, true, yeah. you know and the exposure it just goes around the world right so you know maybe the, the exposure or the renaissance is not something that we physically see anymore you know there's not a like a nightclub setting where you go and you pick up all ambiance it, but it's still out there you know in various forms it, it gives musicians i think a broader venue to to try stuff you know whether it's good or not it's out there yeah, yeah. Yeah. You still see them coming up? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm glad that they don't stop. I, I'm glad that there's always a next generation of music, you know. And, and I'm not trying to sound condescending or, you know, kind of old Papa-ish, but I'm, I'm glad that the <laughs> momentum is still, is still going, you know. So, yeah. Well, you know what? I'm, I really like to hear a song. Yeah, i, I got to okay, reach my stuff over there. We're going to get that one. <laughs> Let's see if we can get somebody to get that for yeah. you. Uh, yeah. We'll take was, a short break, yeah. uh, and when we come back, Bobby Hall is going to play something, and I have heard him play all by himself, not in the <laughs> band, and it's really something, yeah. and he has a wonderful voice. You're going to mm -hmm. hear that in a minute, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Ray, Rich, can you can you move the uh, guitar? Uh, the Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never. Two, one. We're on. Play. Okay, here's a song that um, I like to say was made famous by the Kiwi Moon Band, particularly my uh, partner who's now in heaven, Martin Pahinui. It's a song that was written for us, for him, our good friend Patrick Downs, and it's a song called Flying. I'll do a part of it. Mind you, I'm a, I'm a one man Peter Moon Band, so. <laughs> we love that. You get what you get, yeah. <laughs> Flower lays yellow, white, and purple strands woven like the many days and countless ways we held our hands. Here we are, staring at an airport gate. All those wishes on a star that miss so far will have to wait. Going like an ebb tide flowing, like a trade wind blowing. Soon you will be far across the sea, flying, soon you will be flying, 
like a teardrop drying, leaving just a memory. Oh, lovely. Simple. Thank you very much. It's a beautiful voice. Thank you. So what's it like to be in a band or in a series of bands like that? I I can't imagine. I've never been in a band. It's a social experience. It's a communication, coordination, synchronization kind of thing. Uh, It's it's all of that. Um, When Peter put the band together, he basically selected, you know, musicians who were already you know, part of other groups and who've already recorded and done a lot of stuff. It, it, if, if I may say, he sort of like just assembled a, a technical band, you know, who could, you know, kind of help him envision and do the things that he wanted to create. So um, initially he called me, he called uh, partner Randy Lorenzo. Randy is, is a very prominent musician in Hawaii. He's the original country comfort. Played with CNK, played with the Beamer Brothers. He's the studio musician on a lot of a lot of bass tracks for everybody. Um, and then we added Sarah Pahinui from you know Gabby's son, yeah. and uh, initially Steve Wolford, who also was from Country Comfort and Wolford and Keats at the all time. All experienced, all well known. All well experienced musicians. Like all a super band. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, but, I, but I don't want to call it super band. You're telling me like Peter had a vision. He had some kind of. Vision. I mean, he's always had a vision. Yeah. He was. He's. He's always been the creative genius behind. You know, to me, behind the music. Uh, his skill is playing. He's a. He's what probably, in my opinion, probably the best ukulele player, period, wow. bar none. Wow. And you know, guitar is his second love. Slack key. You know, he plays mm-hmm. that well. Um, but he surrounded himself with you know strong voices, mm-hmm. strong talents that not overshines it, but complements mm-hmm. his vision. Robin and Roland, Casimero, right. You know, he's he's maintained a good relationship with Palani Juan and the Pahinui, So, you know, it, it's it was a deliberate formation. Yeah. Um, as far as being in the band, uh, we've all worked uh, five six nights a week Waikiki circuit. We were all kind of like drained with that. So. With this band, we all committed to be basically work weekends, work when we needed to work, you know, go in the studio, commit to making new music, and, and that worked for us. You know, we were like a part-time, full-time band. Uh, yeah. Got to a point where, you know, we were working every week, you know, at least on Oahu or neighbor islands, and then West Coast, and then Japan, and then well, every place else, around. yeah. Most of the band members, uh, except Peter, you know, everybody was basically pulling a full-time job, you know, as well as playing music. So it it got to a kind of a scheduling challenge for yeah, us. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it makes it complicated because it means, I mean, I, what I hear you say is it's hard to earn a living doing this. Well, I mean, um, the market is is only so big in Hawaii, uh, cost of living so high. You know, besides just earning a wage, and you want to raise a family, you got to make sure you got your, you know, your basics, your medical, your right. Health so, education. So, it, it was a it's a financial decision that we made to hold down two jobs. You know, that's unbelievable. But if if you if a young person came to you today and said, "Wow, I want to uh, uh, make a career in in Hawaiian music in, in Hawaii or internationally," what would you tell this person? I mean, I'm I'm not the best judge of who's the next Bruno Mars <laughs> or the, the biggest star, but you know, um, it, it it depends on you know where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself you know, just playing music for the rest of your life, then, you know, then by, by means, just put your whole life into it, you know. But you, you can't have competing goals. You know, if you're going to be a musician, you be a musician, do the best you can to keep that as a priority. If you're going to be a musician and a, and a father raising two kids, then you got to figure out what you want to do, you know, because by itself, you know, every musician in Hawaii will tell you, you, you just can't, you know, the, the, the venues don't pay that much to... You know, yeah. to and some, some try and they do not succeed. Yeah. Well, and and it's you know you can make a lot in a short time, and then it's what you do with your earnings. You know, yeah. I mean, it should last you till you're 65 plus, but mm-hmm. you know you, nobody thinks that far. <laughs> no. yeah. But you know, I mean, to me, now I'm on the outside of this. Although I used to play the piano when I was a kid, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, uh, I just wonder with this gratification involved. It's more than the money. This gratification. You go down there with a group like that. 
um, giving gratification, to be part of something that's creating something beautiful, no? Music, for me, especially when you do it on stage, the gratification is, you know, being able to share the gift that God gave you, you know, with a lot of people. And, you know, the instant gratification you get from applause or just, you know, if the venue is small enough, you can see it in people's eyes, the impact that, you know, your voice or your instrument is having on them. And you, you're really making a mark in their timeline of life. Yes. You, you really are. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, right. you know, at that time, I, you know, I, I don't know if I thought about it all the time when I was on stage, and I was just thinking, okay, okay, we're going to party after, you know. We're, <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're to go after this, you know. But, you know, in retrospect, yeah, it, you, you can have that influence. You know, I, um, every time you study a band, though, or a, a musician, you find that there are ups and downs. Um, and that, you know, even in the short discussion we've had, it, it sounds like people go from one to the other, mm -hmm. and then something mm, doesn't work out, so they go again, and so forth. Um, what's that like? I mean, wh why do these, I, I want to say disagreements, but that may be the wrong term for it. Why do these things happen that require people to move on? What, what's you the know, process? I think in, in general, and again, my opinion, artists have, you know, a strong ego. Especially, you know, maybe musicians or other type of artists. You know, everybody likes to be in front and, and center. Um, I think what worked for us is um, we were only together a short time. How we, many years? I mean, when I say short time, is, you know, I mean, as far as actual performance mm, playing. Okay. But I played with, I've been in the Peter Moon Band for 14 years. I'm oh. probably one of the longest right. members that stuck around that long. Uh, but is that because I, you're a very agreeable guy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I want to, I'd like to think I, I, I know a good thing when I see it. <laughs> it's called a team player. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you know, as, as far as stage performance, you know, we weren't working six, seven nights a week, four hours a night where you get on each other's nerve. You burn out. Burn, yeah. yeah, and, and you know, just, you know, being together, you, you yeah. can, you can burn out. So yeah. we were together long enough on stage not to hate oh. each other. Okay. If that's the way to put it. <laughs> so you're still friends. You passed it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah. great. That's yeah. great. And, and, you know, although you're playing repetitive music or you're playing popular, yeah. there's always something that somebody does on stage every night that's different. Mm -hmm. And you look forward to that moment yeah. and that just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you right. hear something that, wow, yeah. you know, we did that. Special moment. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's Ever indescribable. Ever listen to your music, your, your re recordings? I mean, I do. You know, I, I don't know if I, um, you know, I do it in, by myself. I don't like to kind of like put it out there. That, yeah, I'm listening to myself. Yeah, but but I'm I'm you know honored that I still hear it. I still hear it on the radio. I still hear it you know places I go. I still hear it on the mainland on internet stations. You know, and it's something that you know, I never thought that you know when I record tonight that it's going to stay for all history. Yeah. So we you know we were, we were, we're glad that um, you know we got good technicians when we did our recording. We did you know old style you know with the Engine, live engineer, and everything like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I believe our the quality of the music that we did is, I is certainly agree. long lasting. You know, but I always thought that we could, we as a state, a society, could do more to really place ukuleles and Hawaii music into our children. Like Canada has a huge uh, program for you know uh, using the ukulele to teach music and to, and there are, we don't have centers to get people together and play, young people, and, and train them. And uh, suppose you went to UH, and one of the prerequisites to graduate was to play one song on the ukulele, right? I mean, if we think of ourselves as very unique people with, uh, with Hawaiian music as a gift to the world, we aren't doing that much to really, uh, really foster that. Do you agree? Well, there's a lot of venues that are doing that, you know, the Ray Sakuma School of Ukulele. There's a lot of more ukulele schools. I think in the actual school curriculum itself, you know, the artists you know, like Jake Chumabukuro, Byron, Brian Tolentino from today, they're making it a point to get it get it out there. So to me, it'll come. It's just like the Hawaiian language, Hawaiian Immersion School. Oh, Hawaii, yeah. yeah, you know, those are, are almost mainstream of what we do nowadays. So it'll, it'll come back. Uh, you know, whether or not it's meant to be Every person has to go and play ukulele. I just think just the awareness right. to know that where it came from, yeah. and you know, if you want to, you can. Well, yeah. you know, in the last few years, um, you know, there's been a lot of change in the in this music industry, mm -hmm. right? We hear about it in the context of mainland music, mm -hmm. but it has to affect why. I mean, the move to the internet, the move to electronic, mm -hmm. the move away from you know performed music and to music you can get on your your cell phone. How has that affected 
uh, people in band music. Can you well, I mean, if anything, it, gave, it sort of gave us a second, third life of exposure because, you know, our music is, is dated. It's from the, the previous century, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, it, it kind of regave it life. You know, people are playing it again and, and groups. I've, I've heard young groups, you know, mimic the style that wow. we have we've so established. So they're re rediscovering the music yeah, that yeah. dates back in the 70s for mm -hmm. today. That's what you're I saying. mean, you know, you know, my grand, not my grandkids, but my nieces and nephews, right. they don't know what I did. <laughs> they don't yeah. know who we are. Yeah. You know, uh, even even like kids in grade school, maybe in early high school, they've never heard of the okay. Peter Moon Band. But if you hear the song and the parents hear the song, they'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll stick with them. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder, uh, you know, Peter Moon died, yeah? No, he's, Peter's still living. He's still living. Yeah, um, Peter suffered a major heart attack and stroke in the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, never re fully recovered, and he's actually um, pretty much paralyzed head oh. down. Oh. So he's, he's still living. He's up in Monolani Hospital. Um, quality of life, probably not the best. Um, left many good songs and memories for a lot of people in Hawaii, including yeah. the musicians that he worked with. Go visit him. Um, not had the chance recently. It's hard, yeah. hard to see. Yeah. What, what about um, you know the band itself? I mean, what effect did that his inability to play have on all that? Well, I'm I'm sure it's torture not being able to do what you've done your whole life. His son, you know, Peter Jr. is is very talented. He's kind of playing in the music scene now, as both a ukulele virtuoso and, and a guitar player. So he, he sort of made sure that the DNA strand continues. Very talented. Um, I don't know too many people as creative as Peter, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, Peter was very creative, you know, and um, was That's smart crazy. enough, yeah. smart enough to surround himself with quote unquote guns that can yeah. pull it off. Well, what uh, an organizational mind to put together, you know, yeah, uh, technicians, together. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, execute a vision as a band. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. There should be a special on him in the future uh, on that whole. Yeah, I hope there, I hope there is. Yeah. yeah, I hope there is. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, what about you? I mean, are you still playing as much as before? What's your trajectory? Right no, now? I mean, um, I've. I have the opportunity to play with friends for special engagements, um, but beyond that, no, I'm, I'm kind of, and, and I don't necessarily miss it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, opportunity comes, we play in the backyard with friends, I mean, that's a high for me. Yeah. So, yeah. Any children or, or family members? Uh, so my father, son, father my, my son. oldest son, Kainoa, yeah. self-taught, uh, very good at, um, you know, uh, Picking up fast. It is hereditary. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's got a great voice, too. Oh, you know, so I'm pretty sure that wasn't from the mom. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, where is, is he playing? No, oh. I mean, he's he, he plays with friends okay. and, you know, sometimes right. he goes out and, and does guest stuff, but no, he's not the on stage person okay. like I guess I was. Maybe that so. could change. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> So we're, we're nearing the end of our sure, show, sure, okay. and I'd like to, you to play another piece uh, on the, at the end of it. But before I do, I'd like to ask you to describe, as you did during the break, about, about your ukulele, what the history really? is. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know if she's around, but this Martin ukulele. A Martin, friend, oh, that's a good quality brand. It's a Martin tenor. Yeah. This is probably, over, you know, I want to say at least 40, 50 years old. Um, a friend at work, you know, brought me this. Uh, this ad that he took off a bulletin, community bulletin board, you know, Martin Uke for sale. He says, hey, go check this out. So I did. I went to a, a lady's house in Mililani, um, and she showed me the ukulele. It was missing one of these keys, and that was it. And it was for sale for $90. <laughs> and I look at the ukulele, and I put my, I, I start feeling the bracing, and I know exactly what this is, and yeah. I just ripped the $90 off and left. <laughs> Get out of there. Go. <laughs> Boy, they changed their uh, minds. I've done some modifications <laughs> to it. I, I reinforced the head. Wow. This is a thicker head, than, and the, this is different type, like banjo keys. So it doesn't have the original, um, you know, Martin, you know, stuff. But yeah. it's a Martin, and you know, I've always loved the sound. So this is your main, your main instrument. This, this is my girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing it down. Bobby. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Please Appreciate play it. us a song on the way out here. Yeah, here I'd like to do, um, you know, I've always been fascinated by different kind of music. So one of the artists that I was kind of inspired by when I was young was uh, Kui Lee. Oh, right. So oh, I'd yeah, like sure. to do a, 
you know, song by Queen. Yeah. Yeah. I could fly like a bird on the wings of the wind. I played in the sun with the joy deep within. I had laughter as a toy and a sweet for my tooth in the beauty. Days of my youth. Everyone that I met was a friend, not a foe. The fears I have learned way back then, I didn't know. Not one deep and kind, or one far untrue, in the beautiful days, the sweet candy days, the beautiful days of my youth.